Guys, welcome. Welcome to Into Live. We had a little bit of a uh, communication breakdown, which is very hard to believe, no doubt, um, when, two, <laughs> when two males are involved in organisation. Um, but Khan just needs to request to join me and we will, here we go. There we go, mate. I was uh, all over the place. Apologies. I was on the Facebook page going, I can't see anything uh, popping up just yet. But uh, that's here so, we are. That's so weird that two blokes would have a communication breakdown. Oh, you never pick it. Absolutely <laughs> never pick it. <laughs> What's happening, buddy? Big fella. Thanks for joining me. Mate, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. It's, uh, it's been a while since we had a chin wag, so I kind of it alluded has. to... Uh, the fact that we go down a, a, a number of different rabbit holes. Um, so like that's all I've been doing for the past few months is going down various <laughs> rabbit holes in this world. So let's do it. I'm excited. I'm keen for this one. So have many of our friends, which um, has been, <laughs> has uh, been it's an just a full blown rabbit hole season this year. It's 2020, let's just write it off as a rabbit hole in of itself, I reckon. It's entertaining at the very least. But. Um, Mate, for those that don't know, you just do a, a quick summary. I don't even know how you summarise yourself these days, but... Um, yeah, great. me either, mate. Yeah, <laughs> Post-2020, yeah. KP. Yeah, great question. Mate, um, I guess uh, I am a bloke, a man, uh, on the man's group chat thingy here. Uh, but yeah, I've been competing. I guess I'd say that I'm a professional athlete by trade. So I've been competing professionally in CrossFit now for six years, let's call it. Um, yeah, it's our kind of earn a crust. I've, geez, beyond that, had a pretty eclectic background. Currently studying uh, my Bachelor of Psychology with Honours and also a Diploma in Counselling. So looking at going down that avenue I uh, own a couple of businesses, uh, or part own one, a uh, part own a gym, uh, own a couple of online kind of coaching bits and pieces. Yeah. And currently an athlete, not quite sure when he's going to be an athlete again. <laughs> so just cruising, dude. But um, yeah, obviously I have pretty similar interests with you uh, in a lot of that kind of like the mental health, men's health uh, mindset, that kind of area, hence the studies currently. But, um, yeah, but I guess that's me in a very roundabout, iffy, wishy-washy nutshell. Perfect. Perfect. Mate, <clears throat> um, there's obviously a number of uh, paths that I want to go down with you, and, and that's been a yep. theme for both of us. Please. I think over, you know, I think we met probably <clears throat> five or six years ago, and one of the things I was kind of drawn to in terms of my interest in you is obviously um, – some of the conversations we've had around psychology and mental health. And mm. it was an interesting one. I felt, you know, my last couple of years in the health and fitness space, I, I didn't have that much in common with a lot of the people in the space. I was just a bit mm. over talking about, you know, sets and reps and that type of yeah. stuff. So yeah. some of our conversations went down a different path, but what got you into mental health in the first place? I know you're obviously a massive advocate for, are you okay, Dave? Um, mm. Which you do very well. But what got you into men's mental health, or even general mental health, in the first place? I think it's kind of a, a bit of a double-edged sword with that. I think uh, first and foremost, then, uh, is is my own kind of ongoing journey with mental health. I call it a journey rather than a battle or a struggle, because that's what I see it as. It, it has positives and negatives, um, and. Yeah, like I guess my whole life I've kind of been fascinated with the way that my head works, kind of aware that it didn't really, aware through conversations with people and hearing bits and pieces that it, the way that I sort of thought and felt about a lot of different things didn't really match up with a lot of other people. So I've always had this fascination with like, well, how come, like why do I think like this but other people think like that? And then why do some people think like, say they think like something and then they go and do something else. So I've always just been fascinated by the mind and then – uh She's going to go back to, say, 2015. So I went through a bit of a mental health breakdown of my own. Um, off the back of that, really kind of reevaluated a lot of things in life. And one of those was wanting to go down a different path. Similar to yourself, I'd been in the fitness industry. Uh, before that, I'd been a writer. I was working as a journo before I started in the fitness industry. 
Um, so I had this kind of a bit of a mixed background and wasn't really sure if I wanted to stay in the fitness industry. And yeah, and then f- uh, secondary to that was also kind of set, becoming a professional athlete myself and seeing how much of being a professional athlete was in your head, was your mental game. Um, that fascinated me equally as much as kind of going on this mental health journey. And at that point in time, I thought, I think I thought being a professional athlete would in of itself bring me this kind of fulfillment and make me feel better about myself in ways that I potentially hadn't in the past. But I didn't really get that. I didn't really get that kind of that sense of purpose and fulfillment from it. But what I did get was a platform and through sharing my experiences beyond just what I was doing athletically on that platform, I um, was able to kind of reach people and to connect with different people uh, on, on about a different thing. And I got so much more value out of that. And then that's kind of what spiraled me down the kind of path of like, well, I want to study this. I want to get into the nitty gritty of both. Yeah. The mental health and mental performance, let's call it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the two different areas, like from a performance perspective and like, I guess, a well-being and, and, you know, elevating your life from here to there. And then also the same is bringing it up from that deficit of, you know, having mental health issues and trying to address them. What was it in, like, you've had time, obviously, to reflect and you're, you're good at introspection and reflection. What, sometimes I spend too much time doing it. Yeah, we've been down that. Yeah, we've both been down that rabbit hole. Oh, um, what's... Um, what what do you think was it about 2015 that kind of led to the breakdown? I think it was the word that you used and, and ultimately, um, I guess, leads to a breakthrough as well, which is mm. the nicer side when you kind of come out, out the other mm. side. What, what do you think led to that in 2015? Made a lot of different things. Um, there was... I mean, like I've got a whole, like a massive family history of mental health. Specifically, I keep saying mental health is this broad term, but what I specifically, uh, and my family specifically deals with is anxiety disorders. Uh, everything from generalized anxiety disorder through to social anxiety and even uh, OCD and stuff like that. So um, I, I've dealt with that since I was a kid with like episodic depression thrown in there as well. I've had diagnosis of ADHD, all sorts of bits and pieces. I had an eating disorder for quite some time, uh, for four years as well, which as a bloke is something that you don't even really ever speak about. So all these Mm. things have kind of for the longest time wreaked havoc on my sense of self and sense of self-worth. And then all of a sudden I found myself in this competing professionally in this sport. Um, And I guess in some respects it was amazing. Like I qualified for the games in 2014 for the first time and off the back of that had all these amazing opportunities pop up. But um, off the back of that, I all of a sudden managed to turn that into this insane amount of pressure. So rather than it being this incredibly powerful, like life changing thing for the best, I turned it into cool. Like this is now you, like this is where your self worth is worth is wrapped up in uh, like whether or not you continue to perform in this sport. And that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Like this, this compounding, as I said, like years of various mental health things that I'd been through. Um, and then the stress and pressure of that, at that same period in time, I was growing this profile within the sport. And I just did that in the worst possible way. I tried to kind of portray this image of man, like I'm just killing it, living the best life, having the best time as an athlete. But Really, like, I I had no money, struggling to make ends meet. I'd just um, come out of a long-term relationship. Uh, My business, I'd started a gym, but that had been thrown to the wayside because all I cared about was training and all that sort of stuff. And, yeah, like, that kind of mismatch, still trying to portray this image and all that sort of stuff combined with the pressure that I felt to continue to perform. Like, And then I went into another kind of toxic relationship off the back of that as well. Uh, at that same point in time, um, yeah, like it, it all just kind of culminated in, in, let's call it a breakdown. And it was like my ex, who I'm still actually quite close friends with now, like my long-term ex, she's a lovely person and one of my best mates. Um, they kind of, yeah, they sort of realized. And that was the first, that was the it's funny because I'd, I'd gone through all these mental health things, but we'd never said the word mental health. It was never within like my family or friends and stuff like that had never really said, hey, like there might be a mental health issue here. It was always just kind of like that was calm or like just a bit weird or like, 
oh, you know, like we, we like everyone, it was this elephant in the room, like, like the eating disorder, for example, it was this like big elephant in the room and that kind of all sorted itself out and all that sort of stuff. But then that was the first time that someone was like, and I think mental health was sort of slowly becoming more in vogue where people were speaking about it. And then finally, <clears throat> um, yeah, then finally we, we started having, I had conversations with people about it. That started a journey in of itself. But um, I think it was just, yeah, compounding things and then a lot of just self-pressure that I put on myself uh, as an athlete. And it's funny, like, if, you know, I put pressure on myself and I stress about so many things, but off the back of that whole experience and the way that I look at what I let wanting to be an athlete do to myself, now, like, now I, I see my, my, my career as an athlete and I look at what I've done within the sport of CrossFit and I'm so genuinely proud because despite all of that, I still kept at it and I still, I did everything that, like, I did everything and I did it properly. Like, I worked hard. I never fucking, like, cut corners or cheated or anything like that. And I look back at this, this thing that was such a negative in my life and could have become so, an even more negative. And in, in many ways, it has actually saved me because it's given me something to anchor myself back to and to be able to look at as, you know what, like even through the absolute pits, you were able to continue on that journey as an athlete. So, yeah, in some ways, that was what kind of brought me to the brink and then has many times pulled me back from it. That, that performance, I don't even know, I'd be interested to see how you labelled it but that performance anxiety and almost that attachment. Um, I would, it, it was, no, it wasn't even performance anxiety, man. It was so much deeper than that. Like I, I, performance anxiety, everyone gets that. This was like, this was like this, like my entire ego sense of yeah. self worth, who I was as a human being was tied to that. So it wasn't even just performance. It was more than my, and it was more than my performance. It was my, it was how I how I was viewed by fellow athletes, fans, all this sort of stuff. And it just, yeah, it was, it was just all consuming, mate, in all the wrong ways. And mm. it, was, it's, it was wild. But, I mean, performance anxiety is just a part and parcel of being an athlete. I love dealing with that now, actually, in a weird way because I find it interesting. But, fuck, I, I didn't even know what I'd label that now. It's just, as I said, it was this straw that broke the camel's back on a very long and complicated journey with mental health, trauma, all sorts of different things. It started from when I was a kid. It's, it's, um, it's almost an attachment to that identity then to a certain degree part mm. of it as well, isn't it? It's interesting you say that because for a lot of um, <coughs> blokes, they're attached to their job title and their mm. income and things like that. And then for, for so many blokes, that's been stripped away this year. And when mm. you really, you know, almost put all your eggs in one basket and, and, you know, attach your ego to it and that's stripped away, you're like, fuck, I'm bare bones. Like, what am oh, I bro. without that? Mate, absolutely. And this year's, been, this year's been really tough. It's funny. Like, it would have been around this time last year I started working with a different psychologist and he was both, like, we were working clinically and with my sports performance as well. The first time I actually worked with a sports psych, which was great. And we actually decided that this year, 2020, was going to be the first season that I went into it with like completely clear mind, clear heart, like full everything, all eggs in one basket. It was, it was, this was the year I was going to put everything into my athletic pursuit. Everything else went on hold, study, work, like stripped everything back, was in a position with sponsors and stuff that I could do it. And that was the kind of goal. And so for six months last year, it was great. Built up, qualified for the games at the back end of last year. And then the whole idea was to basically keep the momentum rolling, take a bit of a break over uh, Christmas, which I did, roll back into this year and then kind of just slowly had all these little benchmarks along the way, steamroll my way to the games and have a blinder of a year. But uh, yeah, like funny how it happens, huh? And, and to be completely honest, uh, I haven't coped with it in the best way. Like it's definitely resurfaced a lot of, things that maybe I had really had under control at the back end of last year and I was really on top of. And so that's been challenging in of itself, but, you know, I'm still here. I haven't still chipping away, mate, still finding purpose and meaning in other things and, and looking beyond. It's been a really great opportunity to look beyond uh, uh, like uh, that identity as an athlete and to look at yeah. like, 
what does post being an athlete look like for me? And perhaps is that, is that something that I want to look at sooner rather than going, you know what, I'm going to hammer it for two more years and see what happens because, hey, fuck, look at what, where we are now. Yeah. <clears throat> I, think it's, I think it's a Buddhist philosophy that the more the attachment, the more the suffering. Is that something mm. that you're aware of in terms of like if you're putting all your eggs in one basket and you're attached to an outcome and then it gets stripped away like it mm. essentially has with 2020 just being a fucker so far? Yeah. Is that, do, do, does that thought even cross your mind or are you attached to things looking a certain way and how do you stay really like dialed in if, um, if you do kind of loosen your grip on, on the attachment to that outcome? Well, it's, it's interesting, man, like when you say that high outcome. So <clears throat> something that uh, through both my own experience and that I've learned through my studies is particularly with anxiety disorders, there's three major triggers. And those three major triggers, particularly for me, oh, and this is for everyone, these are the three major triggers, are uh, um, value. So like how much, how, how attached you are, let's, let's go with that scene. So whatever the mm. Buddhist saying probably fits perfectly in that. Uh, it's probably a stupid textbook saying that's far less eloquent, but um, sort of says the same thing. Yeah, the higher the attachment to the outcome, the more anxiety around it. And then uh, uh, potential for negative. So when someone's giving you kind of, someone else puts a negative in your head. And then second and third and final, and this is a big one for me, is uncertainty. And so mm. you've kind of got all these things going on in the world at the moment. So, mate, it's been hard. I mean, the games is still slated to go ahead. But for me, and that, that's what's worse. I've got this high value outcome thing that I, I was invested in. But it's now, it's not even like I don't have it. Like if, if you, and I've, I've gotten very good at through, you know, not making the games and failing in many, many different ways. I've gotten really good at dealing with failure, no matter how high an adversity, no matter how high like, like value the outcome is. Like I, I can deal with that now. I'm equipped to deal with that. What I'm not dealing with is the uncertainty. What I'm not dealing with is like, am I supposed to be fucking training four hours a day at the moment for this thing? Or is it not like, is this, am I just kidding myself that it's going to happen? Like that is that that's killing me way worse than it not happening. If they canceled it tomorrow or said like no international athletes are going, I go through the, I mean, at this point it would be very quick, like the grieving process. And I, and when I'm working with people, I tell them to go through a grieving process when they don't get something that they really want. And I think that's important. But I'd be able to at least just go, cool, let's move on to the next thing. But what it's, what's killing me right now is it's just like this state of limbo of, mm. okay, I really do want to have a crack at this, but I don't know if I'm going to get to. And I've got 10 mates saying, let's go for beers on the weekend. And I, then on Monday when I wake up, I still got that two-day hangover because, fuck, I'm 30 now and we all know about those fucking <laughs> two, three-day hangovers and you hit 30. And I know that I should just go and suck it up in the gym. I just stay in bed and go. <clears throat> and then it's like, then you go through that whole process of kicking yourself going, fuck, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but then why shouldn't I be doing this? And yeah, man, it's the uncertainty more than the actual loss of the outcome that kills me. Yeah. So are you finding it hard? Like they fuck, there must be a lot of mental chatter. Are you finding it hard to stay on track with your programming? I'm and not, mate, straight up. <laughs> I would be honest with you. Yeah, I have good weeks, bad weeks, and it's yep. extremely hard. But what I'm, why I'm not trying to overload myself with that is because I understand that something like, how, how do I put this? I guess for me, I know how I work, and this is how I work. And I'm not necessarily saying this is the right way for everyone. But I know when there's a lot of mental chatter going on, and it's not positive mental chatter, I have mm. to lower the bar. I have to lower the bar of my expectations for myself. And one of the, like, where do I set the highest expectations for myself? Well, building into the CrossFit Games, probably within my training around the CrossFit Games. So if that's the thing that I have the highest expectations for myself on at the moment, but I know that there are circumstances beyond my control and things going on that are affecting that, that mental health chatter, or mental chatter, I need to lower my expectations on the really high, like on those really, really high stress things or I'm just going to burn myself out and I'm going to end up in a hole like I was before. So honestly, I've been training by feel. If I, have a, if I feel good, smash out a massive day. If I don't feel like training, 
in the morning or whatever it is, maybe I'll wait till the afternoon and maybe I'll get half my training done in the afternoon. If I really just don't feel like it, I won't go, I just won't train that day. And so I've had some weeks where I trained three days, some four, had a really good week last week, trained five, looks like I'll hit my five sessions this week, which has been my goals. But that was it. I went through, say, four to six weeks of just lowering that expectation. And I mean, and this is beyond CrossFit, beyond any of that, there's been some major, like, personal dramas and the health dramas and stuff that have been going on in my personal life um, that have just been taking a huge toll as well. But that's, I mean, that's, that's got nothing to do with my performance, but it does, it still affects that mental chatter. And so, yeah, like, but like something's got to give and that for me has just been what it has been. And again, it's really, it's been hard to jump back into it, but that's why I, I, I lowered my expectations for the re-entry point, which was just do five sessions last week. And I like two of them, three of them were classes, just one hour classes at the gym with the rest of the members. It was great. It was really, really enjoyable. And some of the other ones were like, um, you know, like I trained with a friend, did a quick little workout at home the other day. Cool. I got five days of training and saying this week, I'll get my five days in. Then as it gets like the games is meant to be September 14, as it's supposed to get closer to that, hopefully there will be some sort of clarity around whether I'll be able to leave the country, what the process will be to come back into the country. And if it looks like I'm going to get a shot at the games, unreal. I'll, I'll dial back in and, and I'll ramp it back up. But, and that will become my focus. But yeah, at the moment with everything else that's been going on and, so many other things going on in the world like that's that's and that being probably one of the highest stress things that i can control lower the expectations yeah that's unreal what's what's the difference what are a year three of of psych third well third, so yeah, back yeah. end of the sorry back end of the second so i've yeah. been it's been a very long and strung out <laughs> degree of i did my first year full time and then i went to part time and sort of chopped away Subject here, take a semester off. Two subjects there, take a semester off. So that's the other reason why. I mean, that's been the other cool thing about this whole experience is it's been like, man, I've put that on hold and put that off so much. And I really, that's what I want to do for this sport. Like what has it, like what, why have I done that? Do I still want to keep doing that? Or after this, do I need to change my priorities? So my mm. things like falling over here on the bed. <laughs> Um, what does what does pre psych <clears throat> look like from a training point of view to post? Well, I'll say post psych, but two years in in terms of like Oof. there's a lot of mental chatter that's involved, and obviously you, you're mm. understanding at its absolute best the mental component of training. How does that look different, mate? Do you know what? To be honest with you, I would. Say- say that my journey into the psychological side of things and so, well, psychology as a science started well before I enrolled in uni. Uh, I'm saying that you're top sheet guy, <laughs> Australia dude, mate. Top sheet here, brother. <laughs> but not all the time. Um, yeah, so I'd say my journey into the kind of psychological side of things started around 2015. And I'd, it'd be difficult for me to say whether I've learned more through my formal studies or through various informal studies like research reading conversations working with psychologists and coaches and stuff myself um i mean it's but how i approach things i would say the biggest fundamental change in how i approach my sport specifically are you talking about are you talking about just Mm. life in general no Sport? sport at the moment yeah 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 So sport, I think the biggest change for me occurred when I failed to make the CrossFit Games in 2017. So I like 2015, even though that was kind of when I had this big mental health breakdown, I sort of like started managing that alongside still training and was kind of wishy-washy through that, made the 2016 Games. And then 2017, so for anyone that doesn't know, making the Games is probably, it's like the pinnacle of the sport within CrossFit. Mm. Um, like the top sort of 40, 30, 40, 50 guys, girls in the world compete there. And so 2017 though, I really shifted my focus, broadened my focus. I'd started studying. I'd started uh, like a whole bunch of other stuff. My gym changed and all these different sort of changes had occurred in my life that shifted my focus. And it was the first year that I didn't make the, ga- make the games. So three, and that was like, to me, not making the games was kind of the absolute, like worst thing that could happen. And it mm. happened and life went on. And so, and 
I suppose as well, at that point, I was kind of, I, I was a bit very burnt out from CrossFit and from competing and because of the mental toll that I put on myself, the pressure I put on myself and the toll that the process took on, my, took on me. So I shifted everything. And you know what? It, it, was, it, it, was not, it was nothing to do with my studies. It was nothing to do with anything I read. I just, in through exploring and through experimenting with my process myself, I figured out a new way to look at it. And that was the biggest fundamental change that's happened. It was my own experience happening off the back of um, not making the games. I started training at the gym just with the crew that was training there. We had an awesome crew of kind of really young, hungry athletes that were keen to rip in. Uh, I just, yeah, started training with them. It was really just loving, like training. I was studying as well at the time. That was when I was doing full time. So I was like massively under the pump with study, doing a whole bunch of other stuff on top of it and then yeah just kind of fell back in love with training for the joy of training and that was a, like like being pretty introspective dude i realized that that was making me a better athlete like i was starting to do better in workouts lift heavier like perform better than i'd been performing before training less and just training for the joy of it and that's when i really started to heavily research things like positive psychology and looking into like how positive psychology tied into sports performance focus all that sort of stuff but it was really that self experimentation that then put me down that path and now i mean it's it's massively different now it's it's everything is built around like i said you know, there is, there is a method to everything I do mentally and physically now within the gym from how I dial in my focus, how I build my confidence, my self-talk pre, post and during, or pre, during and post workouts, uh, how I reflect, you know, I write things down, I record things, all that sort of stuff. Like there is, there's that, but it was all spearheaded by that, not making the games and then going on that little journey myself. And even secondary to that was at the end of that year was the first year I was ever asked to go overseas and do a string of seminars and workshops and I went and did it. And obviously my passion being like mental health and that sort of thing, I managed to tie that in. And I saw that how powerful the messages that I sort of spoke to people about like mental health, vulnerability and how I'd used, how I'd found this new way to look at my training, which was actually beneficial to my mental health. And I saw the value that that provided people. And all of a sudden there was this higher purpose in what I was doing. There was, there was this sense of if I continued to compete, it would allow me to continue to connect with these people and to share my story and the things that I'd learned that had helped me manage my mental health. And hopefully then that would then help those people too. And what I was seeing it happen. And so that completely reframed the entire training and competition process for me. And that was, yeah, it was just trial and error. Uh, in, like, do you know what? It was introspection, self, like, it's like self-awareness, reflection. Yeah. And so passionate about those things. <clears throat> Mate, we talk about it a lot with momentum you know, I think it's heavily underrated. Like people talk about ownership and that's all well and good, but you can't mm. own what you can't see. So we're, we're really mm. big on making sure that you heighten that awareness and that <clears throat> inspection, and then you can take ownership of, of what you can see after yeah. that. I really like, you know, one of the things that we talk about often is resilience and backbone and the importance of that mm. and also heart and emotional intelligence. You know, often mm. we're one or the other, but to kind of, integrate both of those and you mentioned vulnerability and and for blokes trying to conceptualize this new way of being in terms of integrating those two things it's good to see a monster like you in the gym and be able to talk about mental health and vulnerability because you know for, for many blokes those two things just don't go together so you're very good at um you know the way that you kind of deliver this stuff online but how, how has vulnerability changed for you from, you know, 25 year old self to 30 year old self and even your emotional intelligence as that's evolved over the last five years through your own evolution and studies mm -hmm. as well? Mate, I think it's funny you mentioned vulnerability and this is this weird, this weird paradigm and like paradox sorry, that I find with vulnerability in men where men are so afraid of vulnerability because they see it as a sign of weakness, but when you dive deeper into it, if, if this is a concept that's universally accepted within, by men as weakness, how much stronger does that make you if you then embrace it, 
right? Mm. If everyone else is saying you can't be vulnerable because that's weak and then you choose to be vulnerable. So the way that I frame vulnerability and the way that I try to or reframe it for myself and particularly try to instill into people that I speak to about it is it's not weakness because if it's seen as weakness and you're choosing still to do it, to be vulnerable, to be real, to be authentic, to be yourself, actually, how strong does that make you? And that's not me trying to piss my Pokemon. Oh, so good at being vulnerable. Look at me. Because I like, I like for me, this is just, I speak about this and I speak about it kind of almost, I try to speak, when I try to speak about mental health, I don't do it in a way that I try to, that I see as being vulnerable. I do it in a way that I see as being like educational, informative and just like open and honest because to me, there shouldn't be stigma either way. It shouldn't require vulnerability and it shouldn't require bravery, but it, I understand it does for some people. So for me, I see it as just kind of, it's just a necessity, but yeah, vulnerability for me now, I don't know. Like I just, I did, it hasn't, it's changed because I'm more consciously practicing it and consciously trying to pass that on to other people. But like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know how exactly it's changed except for I've just, I've just reframed it in my own head and, the more people that I speak to and it's funny, like my inner circle, like my guy friends, particularly we're all, we're all super comfortable talking about when shit's wrong. And that's, I I don't know if I've just got extremely lucky with the bunch of dudes that I hang out with or how much they just force it on because I'm constantly pumping them to like open up about their shit. But or because I'm just a fucking walking like emotional wrecking ball half the time. But like, it, I don't know, it's become, it's just so normal. It's normal to me. And I want to normalize it for everyone because vulnerability really is strength. It's the only way that you can take control of the shit that terrifies you about yourself, mm. about the world, about everything. Because if, if you've got something inside of you that you're terrified of, or something inside of you that's eating you apart, like what's, what is the thing that you're most afraid of? Probably someone else like knowing that, figuring that out. If you're open with that, if you're vulnerable and like strong enough to be vulnerable about that, like you've then got the control over that. And that's how I see vulnerability. That's, that's how I see it in my life. That's how I see it being of value to other people. Um, there's some good chat. I, I think about this. <laughs> <laughs> Buy one of your mates. Jeez, I missed some of that. Oh, no, you need some of those. Um, mate, I really like the way that you framed it in terms of practicing vulnerability because often for blokes, it's a reactive thing. Like the missus mm. puts a question on you and you need to go there or mm. something you know, bad happens and that's where you kind of express vulnerability. But you mm. talked about practicing it, which is really <laughs> obviously a, a very proactive thing. What is like... What does what does practicing it look like, and what type of environments do you like find yourself in where it's like, okay, I've got to show up here? And one of the things that you do do well, and it, I would say it influences your mates, is you're very much a leader in that space in terms of you're the first one to be vulnerable. Mm. You're very kind of clear with it on your your social as well. What does practicing yeah. it look like? Well, like obviously social media for me, having the platform that I do provides a really good avenue for me to do that. And that doesn't mean it doesn't scare the shit out of me when I post something really open. Even having a conversation like this, <clears throat> pardon me, I've done so many like interviews and podcasts and all that sort of stuff. And they all kind of want to go down the mental health avenue because I will always go there. But it doesn't mean it doesn't scare the shit out of me every time. Mm. Um, and so, but it's exactly like when you say practicing this, that's exactly it. It's going, Hey, do you know what? Like Instagram can take a break from workouts and shirtless selfies. And I'll post something real and raw. Sometimes accompanied with a workout or a shirtless selfie for the gratuitous sake. But at the same time, like, <laughs> and then it's, it's, but it's, and it's starting the conversations. It's the conversations with your mates. It's going, you know, like messaging the boys. Like when shit was going down for me a, a little while ago, I reached out. It's just like, fuck boys. We're in a tough spot. Not doing great. And, it's me, I see value from myself in that because then I've got my mates and got my back and I'm so, I'll harp on about my mates till the cows come home because I fucking love them dearly and they are such good boys and they do. Like I can, at the drop of a hat, there's, there's 10 people plus that I could call any situation and I know that they'd be there for me, no questions asked. And that's rare. I don't think that like from the conversations I've had with people, 
I don't necessarily think that that is someone thing that a lot of guys have and I'm extremely lucky. So because I have that to lean on, I'll use it. And then I do that 10, 15 times. The boys realize that when they're going through the same thing, they can do it back because they see the other boys be there for me. They see me be willing to lean on the boys and it just becomes a part of the day to day. Like, fuck, we'll have like little catch ups, like feelings catch ups or like little kind of like, Hey, like, we'll pick that one of the boys has been a bit quiet. And that's the other thing. We'll be proactive in bringing it out. We'll say, Hey man, you never been yourself. Like let's go get food or let's go for dinner or whatever it is. Go for a beer. And that's kind of how we chat about it afterwards. So no, practicing it is just, just doing it. Like, but how, I guess, okay, that's all. So that's all well and good for me to say how I do it. But when, and this is sort of some feedback that I've had from conversations in the past. It's potentially not that easy for people to do that. So, or people don't want to do it publicly. There could be ramifications, X, Y, Z. That's fine. All I would say is go one of two ways. If you've got people in your life that you're extremely close to, start with them because mm-hmm. they're the people that will be there for you. Chances are, some of them are probably going through whatever it is that you feel vulnerable about or have gone through that as well. Second from there is if you feel like you don't necessarily feel comfortable opening up to someone that you're super close to, do it to a stranger. Go and see a therapist. Like Go and see a counselor, psychologist. Mm. There's this weird stigma around doing that, but yet we're so comfortable saying we're going to the, we go to a new gym. Super comfortable talking about like going and seeing a new personal trainer or something along those lines, but we won't say that we'll go and see a therapist. Like you're, you're more pumped to tell your friends that you're like going to a PT that's done an eight week course than to go and speak to someone that's got a doctorate in psychiatry or something along those lines. Like mm. it's weird. It's like a weird dynamic that society's created. So yeah, go speak to a stranger, go and speak to someone who sees and hears it or deals with it every day. Or the last one, like, look for, like, there's resources online that can connect you to people that have gone through similar experiences. Nothing makes you feel less alone and dumb, weird, stupid, vulnerable than connecting with people that have shared experience to you. And, like, yeah. all three of those things have played a role in me developing my, let's call it vulnerability, my willingness to be vulnerable. Um, and each of those in of themselves can work for a different person that's maybe starting on their own journey towards being more open. I think that plays a really big role in, you know, things like AI because <clears throat> empathy is obviously a really good skill to have. And it's a lot easier when you've been through exactly what that person's going through. So, mm. you know, if you're battling mm. the bottle or, you know, you've got an eating disorder or whatever, you know, people can be there for you but there's something kind of special about someone who's also been through it. And I think that's, you know, a real big draw mm. card on your AA and, yeah. and those different kind of recovery programs as well. I mean, what's it, what is it, what is it that we all want more than anything else? And it's connection. How, connection. like what is a fundamental part of connection? It's feeling understood. You, mm. It's so hard. And I've done this. I've been down the path of going to therapists who have all the kind of credentials in the world, but you just sit there and you're like, you're a dude that has no, we don't vibe. There's no similarity. I can't, you not been in my shoes ever before and I'll never be in yours. There's just not that connection. Mm. We connect through shared experience. We connect through understanding. And that's like, that is, that is how you start a recovery. Like I said, it's how you start a journey towards being more vulnerable, which is, I guess, step one in a road to recovering. Well, not even, let's not even call it recovery because you know, mental health has this weird connotation of being like mental illness. But mental health is just your general mental well-being. Like you can yeah. get, you can struggle with stress. You can get really stressed. Like if you have a stressful job, that's mental health. You can struggle with concentration, focus. Like that's mental health. Like communication skills, all that sort of stuff. Mm. Like that's mental health. And managing your mental health requires you to be vulnerable at the very, very, that's the, if there's a pyramid of mental getting better, maybe we can draw one up one day, baby. <laughs> That would be at the bottom, vulnerability. Yeah. Oh, awareness, yeah. then vulnerability. I like that. Mate, there's a question come through, which is cool. I'm just going to um, – it's around COVID. Do you think COVID has highlighted the need to prioritise your mental health over something like working a dead-end job that doesn't actually – that doesn't actually uh, – All right, I can see it here. You've brought it up. I can't say the oh, yeah. thing. Hang on. Let me see if I can click it. 
Uh, I can't say the rest of it, Lukey DB, over a dead end job. Um, can you say the rest of it? Okay. I can't. I don't know how the fuck this thing works, but I can't say the rest, <laughs> the rest of it. Technology, the boys are doing yeah. well. <laughs> um, um, look, to be to be fair, that's a, it's an interesting question. I'll, I'll answer it up until the point of a dead end job. Um, I, I don't know if you're speaking about me specifically or for people in general, but I think I think COVID has been that doesn't actually care about your feelings. Ah, beautiful. Um, yeah. So I guess. Without your, without your mental and physical health, you can't function properly. Like, and that's the same as if you were a builder and you broke your arm, you probably couldn't go on and build. I, I mean, look, I don't know. I don't know much about doing that sort of stuff. My mates, I'm pretty there's sure a running right, joke mate, with my mate. mates about right. how shit I am on the tools. But uh, <laughs> oh, let's just go with me, assuming that you need your arm to, to work on a building site. Um, if, you, if you broke your arm, you couldn't do it. Like you couldn't go and do it. So irrespective of whether your dead end job cares about your feelings or not, if your mental health's not great, and that doesn't mean you have a mental illness, but it just means that you're not managing something in your head, then yeah, that should be a priority. Getting on top of that should be a priority as much as it would be if yeah, like you broke your arm and couldn't go on your building site or whatever it is. Yeah, your, 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 your mental health should, you should have the same weight, in my opinion for whatever mm. that's worth. I mean, yeah. hopefully, I know some workplaces are becoming more open to that and it's becoming a better, com- like there are better conversations going on and I've been lucky enough to be privy to some of those, which has been really, really cool. But um, yeah, like we're not there yet. And that's why, that's mm. the other reason why I'm super passionate, like super ha- happy being vulnerable because if through my vulnerability, other people start to talk about it, it becomes less of an elephant in the room. Like I said, it was like for me for 25 years, then like cool then like then we get to then we can actually start like workplaces will start to take this seriously so yeah I, I, like to me yes it should be the number it should be as important as your physical health in my opinion but if your workplace makes that difficult oh, man that's a tough one it's a really tough one dude like i wanted to yeah i wanted I, I don't, to go I don't down know if I, have the answer. I actually wanted to go down the path that luke he's just um, expanded on, and it, it's a, it's a slight mm, sidetrack yeah. of um, what Khan was saying, but the like the importance of finding your actual <coughs> true passion and purpose is super important. And Khan, have you done much work around like energies, like the masculine and feminine? I haven't actually, mate. No, I've seen sort of various bits and pieces, but it's not a not a rabbit hole, so to speak, that I've gone down. Yeah, you'll go down there at some stage. But Luke, it's really interesting oh, that sure. you ask that. So, from in terms of masculine, Sorry. feminine, and most people no. think masculine equals male, feminine equals female, but we've actually got both in us. But from the masculine point of view, it's super important for you to find passion, purpose, mission, and for a lot of the masculine, a sense of freedom and liberation. So, if you're not if what you're doing doesn't light you up inside, then mm. you will most likely feel a bit flat. And I've been, you know, us Momentum Boys have been massive on making sure you do whatever you need in order to find that passion, purpose, mission to really kind of spark Here's a question that for you on that because I love that. I love that. But here's something. So, like, I've had conversations around that. And you know, maybe my turn to sort of ask the questions. Um, like, what do I struggle with and where I've always found it difficult to reconcile that and how would you approach that with people is at what point does you pursuing, if you're pursuing your passion, your purpose, what lights you on fire, what if that comes at the cost of someone else's, I'm not going to say happiness because it never comes at the cost of someone else's happiness. What if that comes at the cost of like, what if that somehow, uh, affects other people like makes their job harder makes their life more difficult in some way great question. So, so let me let me let me frame that within the context of there's been plenty of times in my life where my passion purpose something has been there like there's been opportunities that i haven't taken because i've thought fuck i know this is going to annoy so and so or someone's going to be pissed off about this blah 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 blah. so how do you reconcile that because this is probably one of <laughs> the biggest struggles I have with that whole, like with the kind of self love and like self love and like uh, Mm. like self growth movements. And, you know, I've read a lot of work from people that kind of put like, they go for the more pragmatic, you know, your purpose should be to help other people. So like when those two things conflict, what do you do? 
It's a good question. I, I'm of the big belief that to be able to support another person in being the best version of them is super important. And I think mm. if you look at, you know, I'm talking about a relationship dynamic, we get so caught in our own shit and what that does to trigger us. Because again, if you come back to traditional masculine and feminine, one of the really interesting things about this is that sense of freedom and liberation that, that mm. the masculine wants. While for a female, there's that sense of connectedness and love. So you've got a bloke wanting freedom and you've got a, a feminine wanting mm. connectedness. So mm. that can kind of bring up some problems in itself. In terms of where that line is, there's some deep work that needs to potentially be done from an introspection point of view because many, I'll, I'll generalise, but many blokes are workaholics mm. and have an addiction and an attachment to that and that's their kind of way of avoiding the other stuff. So mm. where, where's the line? It's a, it's a good question. Um, but not even just, so not even for specifically for a relationship. And I've seen Lukey DB's commented again, but do you not sacrifice your happiness for the sake of others? Yeah. Like that, that's what I mean when I say that that's a big challenge that I find. It's exactly that. It's drawing a line in the sand saying, do you know what? Now my own happiness and mental well being takes priority over the group of people around me who that will maybe then impact. And how do you then reconcile when those people that are unhappy or not are unhappy, but those people that maybe try to pull you down or bring you down off the back of seeing you being successful and happy, then how did like, if that then in of itself, like, is it like, where, where do you draw the line in the sand? So, and I mean, this is, I mean, it's not something that is inclined, like I'm not going through this right now, but it's something that mm. I ponder over, if that makes sense. Like, it's something that I really do ponder over. And I mean, I've, been diving massively into like the philosophy of morality and stuff like morals and all that sort of stuff recently, because I do, I find it so fascinating. And I think the world at the moment, there are lines being drawn in the sand about so many different things. And they are so mm. conflicting. You hear people say like, like, oh, and as I said, it fascinates me. Like you've got this massive self love movement, but then you've got this also like, people are narcissistic assholes. Like where does the sin kind of yeah. go across blah, 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 blah. Like there's, and then, so, I mean, like we're doing it now. It's, it's such a, we live in a polarizing world with anything. Like we're, everything's categorized. It's you, like, mm. where do you switch from being self-love to being a narcissistic prick? Where do you flick the switch from being kind of open-minded to being ridiculous, like a quack? Where does it become standing your ground and oppressing other people? Like there are so many weird lines that are being drawn in the sand and now like, like who, who's judge, jury and executioner besides the mob on social media? Yeah, fuck, don't listen to them. Um, oh, it's, fuck, yeah, man. It's, it's, it's <laughs> That's a whole they, rubber hole. David Brooks talks about this in, I recommended this book. I don't know if you ever read it, Second Mountain. And he nah. talks about on a deep, de fuck dude, it's an absolute belter. Second he talks Mountain. about, yeah, he talks, a... Genoa and Dills will probably give me shit in a second because I talk about it all the time. <laughs> um, he talks about really on a, on a deep level that we are to be of service to other people. So if you, mm. can, if you can line those up, like obviously we're in a really fortunate position with momentum. We fucking love what we're doing and we get to kind of work with other guys um, to be of service and support them through what they go. Here we go. There <laughs> no. um, we go. <laughs> to be of service to them. Um, and you've read Lost Connections, haven't you? Yes. Yeah, so they talk about that, how we are very individualistic often and it's the accolades and the accomplishments and the acknowledgement and the self-fulfilling stuff that actually leads ultimately to our unhappiness and how the sense of connection, community and to be of service to others is really important. So it's mm. a really good question and I don't think we've actually got an answer it, to it, Lukey, but I love well, that's that question. It. Um, but I think that opens the floodgates for, I guess, the other thing that I'm incredibly passionate about. And it's like human behavior and human behavior, particularly on, with the way that the world is trending at the moment and social media and all that sort of stuff. Because I feel like we are being forced into these, you're being forced to pick your aside on everything. Yeah. 
And when we're forced, and I mean, I was chatting, I've spoken about this at length with people recently because it's what's been on my mind. Like, I feel like we have so much to answer for trying to exist online and in social media. Like, our brains are not designed for the amount of information and connection that we now have. Fickle connection, yes, but connection nonetheless. Like, we are, to try and make sense of this, this, this new digital world that we're living in, we're having to create those cognitive shortcuts that have been forged in our brains for like over millions of years of existing and trying to survive in the wild. And we're doing it in a really fucking dangerous and divisive way. And that's by having to categorize everyone and everything into this. And I guess the, the crux of that question was, where do we draw the line in the sand on these things? How, like where, mm. And I mean, it's, obviously, we're not going to fucking answer that in, a, in, in an hour-long <laughs> Instagram chat. Maybe we need to sit down. Maybe we need to do a Zoom call with like six other people. But, um, oh, man, it's just thinking out loud off the back of that comment that you said about that. And that just kind of sparked me thinking about that as well because it is something that's been on my mind recently. But, yeah, bro, it's, it's a strange world we're living in. And it's, it's, a, it's a difficult world to navigate in a lot of ways these days. It's, it's never oh been my. easier, but it's also nah. never been more confusing. If that makes yeah. sense, like we've never had an yeah. easier life, but it's never been a more confusing one. Yeah, mate, couldn't agree with you more. Um, I'll I'll go with one more question because I think after an hour, oh, it might on. cut out. It, so it, it wanna, will. I, it yeah, will. I want to save it. And I have been waffling. I do apologise, <laughs> mate. I love it. I could listen to it for hours. Um, Luke, has got another good question, and I love this question. How have you found your close circles has changed within the last five years as you've developed yourself and grown as a human? Good question. Great question. It's grown, but it hasn't changed. I would still, like, the guys that I was tight with when I was going through high school are still amongst my best friends. And that's... Yep. That's one of the, like, I, I, a girl that I went to high school with just started at the gym that I'm at. And she was like, oh, do you still catch up with many people from school? And I was like, yeah, listed the whole group of the people that I did that I still catch up with. She's like, wow, you still see everyone, like all your friends. I was like, yeah, it was just, I do. That hasn't changed. We've all grown and developed. Perhaps we're all, perhaps because we were all a bunch of weirdos at the start, we've all gone on a similar journey and we've all been open to going on the same kind of journey. So... Yeah, it's grown and it's expanded and I've added people that I now consider to be amongst my best friends to that circle, but I wouldn't say it's fundamentally changed and that's kind of cool. Mate, that is phenomenal. There you and go. It, it, it kind of ties back to what you said earlier around the fact that you've got 10 people that you can um, count on when you're really kind of having a shock of a time, mm. which, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll Oh, 10 at least, it's you, great. yeah. I'll confirm what you, you kind of alluded to, that that's, that's uncommon and that's obviously um, a representation of you as a bloke because, you know, there's that, that bit in lost connection around the most common number that people can confide in these days is zero. And that's, for me, that was as that's heartbreaking wild. as anything mm. as I read in that it book. Is. And fuck, you know, when you're struggling from a, a mental point of view, that's hard enough, but to... Mm struggle and be lonely is is a fucking horrible combination so mate, amazing the crew you've got yeah yeah very lucky mate and, and it, i understand like sometimes when i am going through like really shit periods like there's certain things that'll i'll try not to get emotional there are certain things that i will think about to pull me back i'm gonna i'm trying real hard and one of them is just like being a, like one of them the like my anchors when i am going through a tough time is to think about just like having to be with me mates because it's yeah like I have such a good crew of so many people from, as I said, from when I've known since I was a kid right through to people I've only known for a couple of years. Mm. And like the, I understand how special that is. And it is something that, you know, I, I'm very, very grateful for. Yeah. Mate, I love that. And we, um, yeah, yeah, it's plenty that we can all be, Grateful for, and I know you're good at practicing mm. kind of gratitude as well. So, mate, I think I've got could about be four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck, I think we all could be. Um, but, mate, really appreciate every time we chat, and obviously we chat offline mainly, but every time we chat, there's, there's yeah. plenty of gold there. And um, for those that are part of the Momentum crew, just a reminder, we've got the webinar next Wednesday night. And, mate, at some stage, I'd love to 
get you back. As 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 I said, we um could talk for hours, and there's so much goodness yeah, in that, and no. I love I wanna, love I the way that you the conspiracy theories, brother. <laughs> oh fuck, we'll need a couple of hours for that. Yeah. We'll get Tyson on yeah, as well. For sure. I'll oh, get it. Tyson. Unreal. <laughs> Beautiful, mate. Really appreciate you taking the time and, and so much value in that as well. No worries, bro. Always a pleasure, mate. Take it easy. Cheers, lads. Bye. See you, buddy.